prayer and our message and any children that are wanting to go to the Bible class, you're free to go at this time down the hallway there with one of the Mrs. Savages, I guess the younger. Well, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the hope we have in the Lord Jesus Christ that one day he's coming again. We pray, O oh Father, that as we hear your word, that we would have hearts that are receptive. May the Holy Spirit teach us and instruct us in truths that are glorious because they glorify and they exalt your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we do take this time to also pray for those that are uh, affected by the flooding these past couple weeks and even today. We pray for safety. We pray for help and provision. Most of all, Lord, we pray that in these circumstances that, that you would be glorified, that, that souls would be brought to, to know the God who is the creator of all things and is the sustainer of all things, the one who has all might and power over all his creation. Oh, Father, we pray that, that the one who we have learned through our study through the Gospel of Mark, who causes even the winds and the waves to obey him, that we will see and know him and make him known. Oh, Father, we pray for those that are sick. We pray for our elderly, those who are shut in. We pray for strength and the peace that you give and the knowledge that you are present with your people wherever they are. Whether we are here or in our homes, we thank you, Lord, that you came to dwell among men. That, Lord, you sent your Son into this world and you have sent your Holy Spirit to dwell in us, to keep us. So may these truths, O Lord, be evident. May we rejoice in you and may souls be saved. We pray through the preaching of your word this morning, both here and throughout this community and throughout this nation, that as your word is proclaimed, and we pray it will be proclaimed, that souls would be delivered from the power and kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of your dear Son, our Savior and our Lord. So we praise you and thank you. We give you all the glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, today, many churches gather together to celebrate what is called the first Sunday of Advent. And Baptist churches haven't always traditionally followed that practice, though there are more doing that in, these, uh, in the past few years. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, maybe you've come from a lit more liturgical church and have followed that calendar that has followed uh, you. Advent, for those who don't know, those who do keep it, it is a yearly event that begins on the fourth Sunday before Christmas and or the nearest Sunday before November 30th, and it ends on Christmas Eve or on Christmas Day. The word Advent itself means arrival or the appearing or coming into place. For Christians, it is in reference to to the first coming of Jesus into the world as our Savior. Some families and churches use various colors, candles, and wreaths to help represent or tell the meaning and purpose behind Advent, uh, to look forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus into the world to save his people from their sin. Uh, the candles that are most often lit, one at a time, one on each Sunday, and then the final on, Christmas Eve or Christmas Day are said to represent four truths leading up to the fifth candle representing Jesus coming into the world as the light of the world. And each candle, depending on which tradition you follow, has something to do with hope, the preparation for the first advent of Jesus. Now we have been going through the book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark on our Sunday morning services, but I thought felt led to take a break from that during this time and take this opportunity to present some of the, the truths often present at Advent services. And so each Christmas, each Sunday till Christmas, we're going to touch upon uh, one of the 
four biblical truths concerning the entrance of Christ into this world, the advent of our Lord. Uh, this morning we're going to look at the promise that's given in Scripture of his coming. Uh, we will then, next time, Lord willing, look at the preparations for his coming. Third, the peace that's proclaimed at his coming. And then the fourth will be praise at his coming. Now, Christians aren't required to, to uh, observe Advent, uh, nor does observing Advent make one a better Christian or more acceptable to God. But looking at the meanings behind it in Scripture, it will be a great reminder for us and for those of us who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, the value of knowing Christ and proclaiming not only the truth of his first coming into this world, but rejoice and proclaim that Jesus is coming again, as we've just sung. There's certainly nothing wrong with remembering and celebrating these wonderful facts of Jesus' birth and anticipating his return. Such commemorations and anticipation should be ours every day, should they not? Should they not be in our hearts every day as we, as we live for the Lord, as we wait with anticipation for his coming? Whatever we do as a church body or as individual Christians, that we should do all to the glory of God with the desire to know him and make him known. Beginning then with the promise, others use the term hope, which... Uh, basically means the hope in the promise of his coming, that is the advent of Christ. In this world, people, politicians, yes, politicians are people as well, but they make a lot of promises. Yet we know that many promises are made, but just as many promises are broken. One term that often gets mixed in with the word promise is the word prediction. People often make predictions. The Book of World's Worst Predictions lists some of the all-time prophetic goofs that are found in history. I just want to share with you just a few of those. One was that King George II said in 1773 that the American colonies had little stomach for revolution. An official of the White Star Line, speaking of the firm's newly built flagship the Titanic, launched in 1912, declared that the ship was unsinkable. In 1939, the New York Times said the problem of TV was that people had to glue their eyes to a screen and that the average American wouldn't have time for it. An English, an English astronomer professor said in the early 19th century that air travel at high speed would be impossible because passengers would suffocate. Unlike promises being broken and, of course, predictions failing, when it comes to the promises made in the scriptures, in the Bible, concerning the first advent of the Messiah and the second advent, the coming of the Lord and Savior, we can truly say all has and all will come to pass just as the Bible claims. We do not believe in a hope so promise. We believe in a promise of hope that was and that is and will be fully and perfectly fulfilled in that one man, Christ Jesus, our Lord. During the time of exile and during the period of the Old Testament, the Lord sent his prophets and he reminded the nation that God, who was disciplining them for their sin, would one day send a savior. He would send a deliverer, one who would come to be the sacrificial lamb, who would be raised up to be king over Israel and set the sinner, the captive, free. And as they were in exile, this hope would ring in their ears and hearts as the prophets of God would proclaim this great and a mighty promise. One such prophet was Isaiah. And if we turn, first of all, to Isaiah chapter 61, we read of the proclamation of a great, great promise concerning the advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 61. In 
Beginning at verse 1, as the prophet was led of the Lord and filled with the Spirit of God, given the command to preach and prophesy, he said, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. The carol, one of the carols we sang it this morning, it was uh, one, hymn 123, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. That song takes us back to that time when the remnant of God's people were waiting for this promise of God, the promise of the Messiah, the promise of a deliverer. This was always close to the heart of those who remained faithful to God. As they worked, as they lived in the land that they were exiles in, this promise remained unfulfilled. For some, it surely would have seemed that it would never be fulfilled, never come to pass. But it was God's promise. Again, when God makes a promise, God keeps it to the letter. The way in which this particular hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, is given. It presents the promise of the Messiah. It's, it's given to us with the use of some of the great titles of the Lord Jesus Christ that's describing his character, that describes his purpose. And the verses, they're just filled with some deep theological descriptions of the Lord and why we have the promise not only fulfilled in Christ, but also why we await with the hope and the anticipation of the second advent, the promise of his return. I'd like to ask Arlen if he would put up that song again, put up the first verse of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, because there are the four titles are going to be what we look at and take from Scripture this morning. And uh, So the first one is Emmanuel. Emmanuel, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. In Isaiah 7, verse 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. In that prophecy of from Isaiah 7, 14 that I've just read, where it promised the coming of one whose name would be Emmanuel. It was given at the time of King Ahaz. Ahaz was a wicked king. And so the words of the prophecy were given not because of Ahaz. He was not faithful to the Lord, but it was given to those who were faithful, to the remnant of Israel, for those who were living under this sinful king. And living under the consequences of that sin and that wickedness. And there was a promise given of rescue for God's people from their enemies. For you see, the enemies of Israel, because of Ahaz's wickedness, God had sent the enemies of Israel and they surrounded Jerusalem and they cut off the city in which the people lived and cut off their food and cut off their water. And as the people grew sick and weak and hungry and, uh, and were dehydrating, it seemed that only a miracle could take place in order to defeat the enemy and set them free. And the sign to show the promise of the Lord that it would be true was that a virgin would come and give birth to a son and call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel signifying that it would be God himself who would come and he would deliver his people from the enemy round about them. God would at that time 
come down in spirit and with power to deliver his people from the enemy surrounding them on every side. But that prophecy was not only for their present circumstance, it had more perfect and more beautiful future promise. A promise of hope. A promise given to all surrounded and held captive to sin. Held captive to death. And that promise of Emmanuel was given to Israel about 700 years before the birth of Jesus. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, where we see the promise fulfilled. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18. Matthew 1 verse 18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto you Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sin. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Note here in verse 22 and 23 of this passage, the angel of the Lord, he tells Joseph that all this is happening concerning the conceiving and the birth of this baby, that is fulfillment of this 700-year-old promise. The, the promise is not only that a baby would be born and given that name, the promise has to do with what that name means. Emmanuel, God with us. You see, this promise was that God himself would enter into this world. He would come and he'd make his dwelling place with fallen sinners, with a fallen race. The promise of God with us, brothers and sisters, enters into the name the baby would be given at birth. Note verse 21, she shall bring forth a son, he shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. He shall save his people from their sins. Here in Matthew, we see this great truth that God himself would come. And he would save his people from the greatest of enemies. Just as the promise would deliver the enemy, deliver them from their enemies 700 years prior. Physical enemies, people. Here, the greatest enemy is sin. And he would come and save his people from their sin. You know you're a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. All over the world, people are born in sin. And the promise was that one would enter into this world, Emmanuel, God with us, who would save his people from their sin. God manifest in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, coming to defeat the enemy of our souls. And he came and he defeated the enemy for us and he did for us that which was impossible for us to do. If you are on your own and in your own power trying to defeat sin, you will fail. It is only Christ who is able to save us from our sin. Like those under that wicked ruler Ahaz and the enemy surrounding their city, we all were in that desperate fight for life but in it we were dead we we're subjects of sin and death depraved under bondage yet god's promise came wrapped in swaddling clothes god came and became a man dressed in flesh he lived he ministered among us emmanuel god with us Emmanuel, God with us, also not only means he came and entered this world to personally dwell among us, but it also means that he came to do the work that we could never do. 
that we could not do, which was to defeat the enemy and make us to be acceptable to God, to have the Lord God on our side. And here is something so precious and so so wonderful and so amazing is that Emmanuel, God with us, means that God came to be on our side. He came for us and to be for us. And therefore, because he came, We are no longer his enemies, but friends. We're no longer aliens, but we're sons of God. Revelation 21.3 says it so beautifully. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. They shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Emmanuel, God with us. This is an act and a declaration that God has come. He has come to seek and save the lost. He has come to dwell within our hearts, the hearts of his redeemed children. He has come to conquer sin and death. He did so when he went to the cross. He gained the victory. And through the Lord Jesus Christ, the sinner is now made a friend of God. And that's why we shall call his name Emmanuel. It's being interpreted as God with us. The second verse of the hymn gives another title. Put up the second verse. Note the word day spring. O come, thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits by thine advent here. The word day spring is, of course, an old English term. It's not a term we normally use today. The term we would use would be sunrise. It refers to the sun rising in the east. As the sun rises, the darkness of night begins to disappear. All that has been overshadowed in darkness becomes seen. It it reveals. As the verse 2 continues, disperse the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadow put to flight. This promise was given in Malachi. We turn to the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. Now this is the word that will be used in the King James Version. Where we read Malachi 4. For behold, the day comes that shall burn as an oven. And all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the sole of your feet in the day that I shall do this, says the Lord of hosts. So we note here, King James says, the son of righteousness, and and it's spelled S-U-N. But it is in reference to the son, S-O-N, the son of righteousness, the son of God. The day spring, as referenced in this song that we sing, usually at this time of year. It's in a time of darkness that the people of Israel when most were simply going through the motions here in Malachi, they were worshiping God, but they were worshiping him with dead hearts. They, they saw bringing their offerings and their sacrifices as a burden. It was to them all meaningless. The, the sky, as it were, was darkened. And they were saying, where was God? What is this? all that we're doing what's the purpose in us of of gathering together and bringing sacrifices it seems empty and to them it of course was 
And it was a stench to God's nostrils because of their wicked hearts as they're bringing their offerings, they're, they're keeping the best for themselves, and they're, they're bringing the broken, they're bringing those with, with spots and blemishes. And so the Son of Righteousness was truly unrevealed to them because of their sin. Their sin had separated them from God. And this promise, though, was given. God gave the promise of the Son of Righteousness that he would arise, he'd bring healing and life, but also that the Son of Righteousness, when he'd come, would also bring destruction. He'd burn up the chaff. He'd bring judgment upon those who would not believe and receive him. But for those who he came for, those who were his sheep, those who were the wheat, he would show mercy. He would show grace. Luke, in the writing of the gospel that he was inspired to write in chapter 1, Luke 1, verse 71, or sorry, 78, he wrote, Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. When that was written, that was written concerning the time in which John the Baptist was going before preaching, preparing the way for the coming of Jesus. Remember John the Baptist was proclaiming, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his way straight, and calling the people to repentance. And so he would go before the Messiah preaching, prepare the way of the Lord. And he would proclaim, the day spring is coming. The day spring is about to rise. The sun of righteousness is about to show himself. The light of the world would, would soon step into this world of darkness. Step down from glory and enter this world of sin, darkness of sin. And Jesus testified to the truthfulness of the promise and its fulfillment, claiming, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. He's the son of righteousness. The day spring has arisen. He's come. And he has revealed to us his mercies, his tender mercies. He has first revealed to us the sinfulness of our heart. He's revealed to us that we are, without him, we are condemned. Without him, we're worthy of being burnt up, as it is stated here in Malachi 4, verse 1. But because of his mercy, he's also revealed his kindness, his love, his grace. And by his mercy, he has set us free from that kingdom of darkness and transported us into the kingdom of light. We now walk in the light as he is in the light. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. O come, O come, Emmanuel. O come, day spring. Then if you put up the third verse, if you would, Arlen. Thank you. It says, O come, thou wisdom from on high, and order all things far and nigh. To us the path of knowledge show and cause us in her ways to go. Another title given to our Savior, to the one promised, is wisdom. The promise of wisdom or the wisdom, the wisdom from on high. It's, uh, this wisdom referred is not just simply being smart. It's not just simply promising that somebody will do well in school or be able to make some wise career choice. But rather, this wisdom, again, is the person of Christ. And it's a promise that was given in Isaiah chapter 11. Let's turn to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 11. Of all the prophets, we all did have proclamations of God's wisdom. Isaiah is one that gives such clarity to this wisdom and who this wisdom is. Isaiah 11, beginning at verse 1, 
It says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. What a great promise this is. This reveals the very nature and character of Emmanuel, of the Lord Jesus, of the one who would come, the promised one. Uh, Note that the one promised would be a descendant of Jesse. This one would come also with the wisdom of God. He would be God, the, the wisdom of the ages. Mankind is forever on this eternal quest for information, for knowledge of things, and what many of them refer to as light. Yet with all these philosophies, with all these ideas, these teachings of mankind, including all the different religions of the world, they all come under the definition definition made in the Bible, which defines them as foolishness. Foolishness before God. Man seeks illumination, but does it in the dark. Man seeks religious experience, does outside of the kingdom of light, and does so with a foolish, darkened heart. It is all darkness because it doesn't come from the wisdom of the ages, it doesn't come from above or Father. Above, But like the Pharisees of Jesus' day, it comes from sinful heart and comes from the father of all lies. Man has no light of which they can use to come before God and find mercy. They have no knowledge or wisdom within themselves. Therefore, they don't seek God. They seek their own God. They seek their own imagination. It's all kept them separated from God since conception. Man presents to God false lights, false intellectual knowledge and philosophy, saying, here is the wisdom that will bring me to you, God. My good works show my wisdom bringing me to you, God. But they don't. My wise intentions bring me to you, God. But they don't. My wise sincerity brings me to you, God. But they don't. It's all foolishness. It's all darkness and sin. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 27 through 31. Listen to these words. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. You see, only when Emmanuel is with us, only when the day spring has risen in us, can one have and know the wisdom of God. The wisdom that saves. For the unsaved, the gospel, the, the preaching of the cross, the Bible says it's foolishness to them. There was a time for you, probably you can remember, where the preaching of the cross was foolish. Or it didn't make sense to you. It it just seemed unreasonable. But then Emmanuel came. The day star, star, the, the son of righteousness, rose within you as he came to you. And raised you from that darkness of foolishness. And gave to you his wisdom. So that you might see and know the truth. That there is only one Savior. That there is only one God and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
And you were brought to see, as I was brought to see, that everything I had put my trust in and my hope in, and whatever you put your hope and trust in, that was what was foolish. That is foolishness. And that the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom. And because of that, now you can stop giving humble praise to self and thinking, look how wise I am. Look at the great choices I've made. Look at the path I've made for myself to God. You can now say, oh, I only glory in the Lord. I only glory in Christ. He receives all the glory and praise because it's his wisdom. He has become to me wisdom. He's the wisdom of the ages. The promise is Emmanuel, God with us. The day spring shall arise. The promise given that the wisdom from on high would come. Well, verse 4 speaks of the one then called in verse 4 of our of our you can put up the next one, Arlen, for us. The day spring or the desire of nations. The desire of nations. So come, desire of nations, bind all people in one heart and mind. Let's turn quickly in the remaining moments of our time to Haggai. Haggai chapter 2. Again, in the Old Testament, prophet of God declaring great promise. Haggai chapter 2. Going down to verse 6. Thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Now in this particular passage, when Haggai was proclaiming this, uh, we, we see this where the people of Israel had returned from captivity and they found the temple that Solomon had built gone. It was totally destroyed. It wasn't there. And there were some among them that would have remembered how great, how beautiful this temple of Solomon was. The glorious days of that temple, the splendor, the majesty, the presence of God in the Holy of Holies. But now as they arrive, as they see the scene before them, it looks much like the little town of Linton looked this summer after it was burned to the ground. It was just rubble, rubble and weeds grown up. But as their hearts are filled with this sense of kind of gloom because of it and sadness and sorrow, especially for those who were in old age who remembered when they were young being taken to that great temple, as they're filled with sadness, they are brought this wonderful promise. The promise of, as it says in verse 9, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, says the Lord of hosts. Oh, the promise is given that the prophet of God points them to the coming of a greater than Solomon's temple. In verse 7, when he would come, he would shake all the nations. This is... This is language often used in the Old Testament in reference to the setting up of the kingdom uh, of the Messiah. There were, the, the language is one kingdom being crushed as another kingdom is built up upon it. And it sets out this, this picture, this vision of the kingdom of God, as you see in Daniel when it talks about that, that stone that, that breaks all other stones and becomes a mountain and grows to be a mountain that fills the whole earth. 
So we see this picture that, uh, of this kingdom. And when the, the promised one comes, he would set up a kingdom that would destroy and conquer all other kingdoms. Remember when the Lord Jesus was upon this earth and when he was uh, crucified and also when he rose from the dead, there was a great earthquake. That was a physical shaking of the earth. When Jesus hung upon the cross and he, and he died for our sins and when he was buried in the tomb and he rose from the dead, there was a great earthquake. Not just a physical one. But a kingdom one, when he shook the very gates of hell, when he, when he crushed the serpent's head, and he came forth, as it says, conquering and to conquer. And he took captivity captive and gave gifts to men. And he caused the curtain in the temple to be rent in two. It, it showed also that, that renting of the kingdoms, showing that he was the only way to the Father, tearing down the wall of partition or separation between Jew and Gentile, and between all nations and God. The promise revealed here in Haggai reveals him as the desire of all nations. And how is he the desire of all nations? It's simply this, brothers and sisters. The Messiah promised, Emmanuel, God with us, the day spring that it would arise and the wisdom from on high would come to save his people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Matthew 12, verse 19 says, He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he sends forth judgment unto victory, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Are you of those that trust in the Lord Jesus this morning? You know, it was mentioned, and I actually mentioned it to our brother Wayne, that before he passed away a couple of weeks ago and went to be with the Lord, I said, one of the things I am going to miss the most is his amens when I'm preaching. So we need some of you to be ameners, take his place. Are you of those who trust in the Lord? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Is he the first and the greatest desire of your heart? If he is, you have every reason to say amen. You have every reason to rejoice, as the hymn writer repeats in the refrain, Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Because he has come. There's another verse for this song. It's written by a different composer, and this is what it says. O come, Messiah, come again, and rid the world of death and sin. Return, thou risen Savior and King, that heaven and earth at last may sing. Those who have put their faith and trust in the one who fulfilled all those promises that we've looked at this morning, the Lord Jesus, who is Emmanuel, God with us, the day spring who has risen, Wisdom from on high, the desire of all nations, the one who the Gentiles put their trust in. If you believe, and if you trust in the promised one, the Lord Jesus, if you believe that he has fulfilled all those promises and is the fulfillment of his promises, you have another great promise. And that promise is his second coming. The promise of the second advent. Just as he came the first time, fulfilling the promise of God to save his people from their sin, he will come again as promised for you and me to take us to where he is, to be with him forever. That's a promise that, like those promises, will never be broken. 2 Peter 3, verse 3 says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Yes, there are mockers in the Old Testament period. Then where is that Messiah you're talking about? But he came. He came. He entered into this world. Emmanuel, God with us. And there are mockers and will be mockers who will say, where is this 
Jesus you've been talking about. For over 2,000 years, you've been saying he's coming again. You've been singing those songs. Jesus is coming again. But it's always he is coming. Where is he? Why is he taking so long? The promise is given, brothers and sisters. In 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If you're a mocker, if there's any mocker who's, who listens and would even later listen to this message, you're mocking the idea, saying, Where is he? Oh, brother... Listen to those words, that his promise is sure. He's not slack about his promise, but it is still a day of grace, still a day of mercy. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so if there are any mockers, oh, that you would come to repentance, for the time is short. The promise is sure. For it says in 2 Peter 3.13, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. If the Holy Spirit, through this message, has revealed to your heart that you're not prepared for the second advent, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, repent and believe. Believe in Christ. Repent of your sin. Repent of your mockery. Repent of your unbelief and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who promised and was promised and fulfilled all those promises and his promise to come again. And he's promised that until he comes again, he's showing mercy, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Just as Jesus came the first time to seek and to save the lost, so he'll come again. When he comes that second time, he comes to judge. Let me be very clear here this morning, and, and, and I know that uh, maybe all of you are saved, but we should never take that for granted. If there are anyone here this morning, let me be very clear this morning to everyone, when Jesus Christ comes the second time, there will not be one moment left to repent. According to Peter, he writes that when he comes, yeah, there won't be a flood, but the earth will burn up with fervent heat. It'll be a day of judgment when he comes. It'll be a time when he will separate the believers from the unbelievers. He'll cast the unbelievers into hell forever. And all those that are from every nation will be led in victory into heaven, never to leave that glorious home. That's his promise. His promise will not fail. And so put your trust in the one who will not fail. Trust him today. Trust him now. Those of us who are Christians, rest in him. And hope in him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Rest, trust in the hope that the Savior, Emmanuel, God with us, the day spring, the wisdom from on high and the desire of all nations has come. He died for our sins. He rose in victory for our justification and he's coming again. And we pray and we wait for the promise of his second advent as the book of Revelation, as John and the saints cried out, O come, Lord Jesus, come. And come quickly. May we be ready as we wait upon that promise with great hopefulness, for he will come. Amen.